Well, I've got a little bit of news for you. I've just had an SMS from Simon, who was up for jury duty, but he was dismissed at 3.45 this afternoon and will be back tomorrow. So I wonder who I'm working with tonight. I think you know that that's the uh, signature tune of Andrew McLaren. He will take it to his... In fact, it might be played at your funeral. That'd be appropriate. I, 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 I don't, don't consider me rude, Phil, but I'm sort of hoping not. Yeah. I've the, never or, heard of it. Or not too soon, at least. No, no, for a few months away, please. Give me till uh, Christmas. Now, now, Peter Hitchener isn't free to come in tonight. We were thrilled he was here last night. So we have two hours of open line. Your call and we have the prizes. And somebody's going to say to you, are you a Don McLean fan? Well, I was until recently. He said, I don't like the charges that have been laid against him in America. Yeah, well, that wasn't the point I was going to raise. I always admired him, and he was sort of a hero of mine, until he came to the Gold Coast, performing at Twin Towns, and I interviewed him face to face. And his answers were so dull, they were monosyllabic. Oh, how boring. And as you might know, yes, he had planned a tour this year, but then had some uh, alleged domestic assault charges pending and wisely postponed the tour till next year. Yeah. But I was so disappointed the, the answers were just so boring. Why does why he suddenly spring to mind that, Don McLean, to you? Well, I, I have a reason for telling you. Ah. Well, I mean, he is a poet, isn't he? He's written some yes, beautiful, songs. beautiful songs. Yes, beautiful uh, songs, But it, uh, it raised... I had Don McLean on in the car tonight. Uh, he was on my mind. Uh, but it raised the topic. Have you ever... Have you ever met a celebrity that you perhaps admired greatly, but were disappointed when you met them? Oh, you yes, know, and, yes. and I'm sure it's happened to you. Somebody you've had on a pedestal, and uh, you've met them at Countdown <laughs> or at a rock and roll concert, and, and suddenly, uh, you know, you feel very deflated because they were human after all. Oh, have you yeah. had an experience? Oh, several. Several. Well, several. people you've interviewed, uh, Yes, I have. You people I've interviewed, no. Can one, you name names? Well, one was, this was backstage at a Melbourne venue that's now gone. And an uh, American singer, oh, will I name him? He's passed on. I don't like to speak ill of the dead. Oh, no, but you'll gloss over it. A famous American singer. Talk about his good points. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't see any in the, in, oh, during uh, the ten minutes uh, I spent in his company. Was it? I, I don't know. I don't, well, uh, oh, come on. Uh, uh, Robert, just... Robert Goulet. Oh, you've mentioned already that he was drunk on stage <laughs> one night and you were well, very no, disappointed. I, well, well, it was, well, so much he was, I don't know what he was on, but uh, backstage with the interview, it was just a, a chaotic. It was absolutely... And, and and the scene is spread eagled on this sort of divan in the in the dressing room. <laughs> he's got his shirt open, his tie is all sort of. He's on stage in about ten minutes, as far as I could work out. <laughs> and, and he's got where a. Where was this? The swag or where were you? He was feeling no pain. It was the swagman, yes. And uh, Robert oh. is feeling no pain and is enjoying the sight of a rather cute waitress from the swagman yeah. who was dispensing drinks. And did you stay and see the show? Uh, no, no, oh, okay. I didn't, no, no, I didn't say. Uh, well, no, you know, no, that was no, not at all. Okay, I saw him at the Chevron in Sydney, and and he was under the influence of something, and he wasn't disciplined that night. You know, he's throwing his best songs away. And, oh, uh, was he? Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, you get very let down when that happens. Yes, I, there are those moments where you think, what is this all about? And I've got my little Nagra tape recorder. You know, <laughs> there's a very heavy tape recorder. I'd love, I love to hear this interview. Uh, no, no, it never went to air because I couldn't be oh, bothered. Okay. It, it was just, I, I, I'll ask him a question, and you get an answer like, um, uh, when did you first start off on show business? Ah, show business. It's a, it's a mugs game. Or, he wouldn't say mugs, that's Australian, but mm. I don't know. Show business to me is just highs and lows, Andy. You know that, Andy? Uh, but, well, thinking, well, but that's not an answer. Yeah, but he would have been asked that question a million times. I know, that's the thing. And this is the thing. I, I've always, I didn't interview him, but Mickey Rooney, to me, only gave... Ten set answers to him, no matter what the question oh, was. Oh, really? Yeah. If I've heard over the years, uh, well, there's a compilation on YouTube if anyone wants to look on the on the internet of uh, Mickey really giving interviews. <laughs> and as, and no matter what the question is, if you say, uh, you, of course, you started very young in show business. Yes, Judy Garland, I work with, and, and Clark, and he gives the same answer. <laughs> oh, to every, bless him. Yeah, and then if you ask about the marriages, he's got six set jokes because he had what six or seven marriages. Yeah, he, he yeah. does his marriage jokes, yeah. and then he does his uh, going broke jokes. Oh, okay. And, and, there's just this, and, and I can sort of see Mickey's point of view that yeah. by the time these interviewers came around in the 60s, 70s mm -hmm. and 80s, he's, he said it all. I tell you, it was very disappointing because he was such a great artist. Ray Stevens, who had songs like Everything is Beautiful yeah. and they have the Arab. Yeah, you know, all that some funny very stuff. Cute yeah. I interviewed him and the dullest answers in the world. Yes, yep, and nope, and no. <laughs> but can I tell you my Mickey Rooney story? Yeah. And I think Ken was a party to this. 
Oh, it, it's uh, it. Oh, it's such a shame. Uh, Mickey was on his way to Australia, and I did a phoner with him in Florida. And Paul Cronin was working with me because Bruce was away. And the interview was going wonderfully. And we started talking about the Louis B. Mayer years and the MGM stable of stars. And he really opened up. He had wonderful stories about Tarzan and Clark Gable and uh, all the people he'd worked with, Elizabeth Taylor and all the uh, movie moguls like Irving Thalberg and Harry Kahn. It was going superbly. I can't tell you. He wasn't giving me stock answers. Okay. And then some Suddenly Paul says to him, yes, it was like that at Crawford's. When I was at Crawford's and Dorothy Crawford was producing D20, well, it went like a, it went like a prick balloon that Paul was comparing Crawford's to MGM in Culver City. Not quite And, the same. and sadly, uh, sorry, Paul, but we lost Mickey. He wasn't interested in hearing about Crawford. He was telling the best stories about Judy yeah. Garland and all those people we've grown up with, you know? Yes, I know. He interviewed Johnny Ray, the great cry singer of the 50s. Yeah. Uh, you know, Just Walking in the Rain and all those songs. And, and uh, yes, tonight, Josephine interviewed him at Rockman's Regency Hotel. Okay. And he was a bit deaf, wasn't he? In one yes, ear? he was a bit deaf. And by the time I was interviewing him, he was no longer a young man. Right, and, okay. And... and uh, Johnny was drunk, and that was sad. Oh, yes. Look, he was pleasant and polite, yeah. and, and I put the interview to air. It was good. And okay. I, and, but uh, he was slurring words, and he was just away with the pixies. Yeah, unfortunately, their career's on the skids by then. You need to be disciplined. You know, when you're in showbiz, you need to be like an athlete, don't you? Yeah. And pace yourself. And that's what we're doing, because we've got a full board of calls, and we have to take a break. Uh, Google where my plot is at Burundara Cemetery in queue, yes. uh, so you can have it on your GPS, and occasionally you might care to come and pay your respects. Well, I often do, because I go to the Syme Memorial there, because of the Syme family, a very famous family. Oh, it's from the Age. It's from the Age newspaper. And we're What's currently your connection? Looking, well, no connection, but I, I always uh, pay tribute to the people who provide part of our salary here at Fairfax, remember? Oh, the that's age? right. Yeah, it's always a, a little tribute, not just the current members, but also yes. those before. Oh, yes, I feel the same way. I'm very much a company man, you know. Yeah. I do it their way. That's why I'm hanging on to my job for dear life. <laughs> Clinging on, I think, these days. The fingernails are being prized <laughs> up know, one by one. I feel like Tarzan on a vine. <laughs> but I'm still here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> if only that lap lap would just be a little higher. <laughs> yeah. It would really be good to hear. Go and visit them. 20 past 10, this is Nightline Andrew McLe uh, McLaren filling in for uh, Simon Owens. Uh, uh, I'd love the ratings before we take off. Oh, OK, yeah, and, fine. And then we'll talk to Rob Chris. Tony, Lowe, Shane, and talk to you as well. Yes, that's right. Now, yes, Melbourne's top ten. These are the Going most watched... backwards? Yeah, most watched programs last night in this city of uh -huh. ours. Number ten was Home and Away. Okay. Yeah, I still rating well. Uh, hot Seat, that would be Eddie's program, wouldn't it? Oh, well done, Eddie, in the 5.30 time slot. Yes, ABC News, Evening News, uh, was came in at number eight. Mm -hmm. Married at First Sight, that program with the most ridiculous premise, but it mm -hmm. seemed to be rating okay. Not and I'll be happy with that. Yes, a current affair, still strong. How many years has that been going, Phil? Oh, must be for, for forever. 40, 40 years. Right? Yeah. Uh, seven News, Today Tonight, that's on seven, obviously. Uh, came in at number five. Uh, seven News, that's the six o'clock news, isn't it, as such? That's right. Yeah. It's in uh, two half hours. Yeah. Number five, uh, uh, number three, I should say. Nine News, uh, ahead. Uh, Peter will be pleased, and the crew there. And Tony and Lavinia. Oh, oh, yes, I'm sorry, the whole crew. And uh, number two, My Kitchen Rules, on seven, still an absolute powerhouse. Yeah. And what do you think was the number one program last night? Uh, probably National Line News with Peter Hitchin. It was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well done. Hitch and all the gang. Yeah, well, very good. So there all you are. No, right. Nothing from SBS here, nothing from Channel 10. Uh, no, no, not in no, this top be, ten. Ten will be disappointed. Right, now your fans want to talk to you, Andy. <laughs> they do. Rob is there. Hello, Rob from Malvern. Bonjour, Philippe. G'day to you, Andy, and how you been doing, my lad? Oh, very well, thanks, Rob. Good to hear your voice. And bonjour, Philip. Yes, uh, likewise, Rob. Yeah, um, I've got. Uh, I'll keep it short and sweet because you've got a lot of the guys here. Um, Yogi from Marty Martel, Philip wants to know when you're coming back. Uh, explain yourself, Rob. Marty Martel, it's the um, Indian restaurant across from the depot. Oh, I, I was taken there once. I haven't been there since, but yes, I really enjoy the cuisine. Yeah, well, he, Yogi wants to know, he's the chief waiter there, he wants to know when you're coming back. What's his name, Yogi Bear? Yes, Yogi. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, I do love Indian food, I'll make my way back sometime, Rob, but okay. I will arrive, I promise you, on the number 16 tram. Okay, well, <laughs> two bits of information. First off, 
the 21st of this month, which is Anzac Day, is the last day that you'll see Z1 trams uh, in service in Melbourne from mm -hmm. Melbourne Depot, because yeah. as of the 21st, they will be out of service. And did they replace the W class? They were the ones that came after the W. They were the two-door. Yes. Yep, and we've got 11 left at Malvern, and they will be going as of the Monday week. When oh, you say when you say going, Rob, where do they, will they yes, actually go? Yes, yes. Uh, they're going to Preston Workshops, where they'll be mm. probably dismantled or sent out to contract. Okay, I'd like one in my back garden. How would I go about um, buying one of those? Uh, go to either yarrowtrams.com.au or the PTV. They're going to have to deliver it uh, to Q and also over a two-storey house. There's oh, no the side crane. lane. They have these modern things, Philip, called cranes. <laughs> okay, I'll think about it, Rob. Yeah. Yes. And Philip, Philip, before you go, also 21st for eight days, Glen Free Road will be closed off because we're having the whole front of the depot and the depot overhauled. Okay, closed from where to where? From High Street down to Wattle Tree Road. Thanks for the warning, Rob. Thank you, guys. Have a good okay, night. Okay, bye. All the best to you. Chris at Broadmeadows. Hello, Chris. Hello, Andrew and Phil. Yes, How Chris. Good day. Phil, I don't, I don't want to start off calls bringing up about antiques and collectibles because there is a time after midnight on Wednesday morning um, to talk to uh, Luke Boner and the crew about and, and, and Rick Milne, but... Um, my my neighbour wants me to get a uh, evaluation, and uh, he doesn't necessarily want to sell it yet. Um, and he wants me to get an independent valuation. He's got an old Terex, uh, a GDV9 lapel pin with a Terex symbol on it from the Terex show. Yeah, they're quite common, many people uh, are. Aren't they? No. Oh, right, fair enough. But I think it might have some value, though. <laughs> Guys, it would be worth a fortune, but it would have some value. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to go to an antiques or collectible shop and try and get anything to do with Christie's auditions, if, if there was such anything around. Because oh, you'd be lucky. Because my mum was known as Little Patty in her singing days. Yes. Yeah. She, she was given three gongs twice, and she was the guest singer at Christie's. Mm. They paid two guineas to, to be a guest. Yeah, Christie's. that was more than 60 years ago, and it was a radio show. I don't think there'd be any props around, sadly, Chris. Yeah, but um, uh, my, my good mate and neighbour is in hustle today. He had an operation, and uh, he had some broken complications and went into intensive care, and I thought, oh, God, no, you know, just... I, starting to get very worried and tense. But oh. I rang up the hospital uh, later this evening and they said he's starting to recover well and he'll be moved back into just into normal wards uh, tomorrow. Mm. But uh, I'll go and pick him up. Uh, if it's not tomorrow, if he's OK to go home or Friday, um, I'll try and do my best because um, on Friday I'm also the captain of my pool team for okay. my community centre in the Reckling Pool League for the homeless and disadvantaged. So. Okay, well, we wish him well and hope he does well. And speaking of the um, Tarek show, as Chris was, today is the 94th birthday of Ron Blaskin. Oh, Jerry Isn't it, uh, Bless him. I spoke to Ron, he's got all his faculties, very alert, really on the beam. Isn't that amazing? Uh, we talk to him occasionally, he gives a wonderful interview about the early days of TV and is certainly an icon of. of of this town. I wonder if he's still got the moustache. Remember that black moustache he used to have? Yes, I do, yes. yes have yes. you seen him of late? Yes, I see him often and he's looking wonderful. Isn't that terrific to have and, that sort of uh, longevity? And, uh, you know, his family follow in his footsteps. Peter's Jerry in, G, uh, Jerry G, who and what and where is he? Yeah. 94, well done, Ron. Yes, no, I, I'm glad to hear you around. Uh, Gigi, good morning. Nice to hear you're around too. <laughs> good evening, Andrew. It's not morning. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> you poor thing. I can't um, get out of it. I know you can't. It's too long. It was too long. Yeah, good to hear you on the radio, Andrew. And Thank hello, you. Philip. Yes. And, um, yes, I wanted to mention that many years ago, and I'm talking probably late 1970s, yeah. I was invited by a celebrity of the time to the call of the card at the Melbourne, for the Melbourne Cup. And it was the first time it was being televised. Now, I think it was... Which was the hotel that had the Clevedon room? That was the Hilton Hotel in East Melbourne, Jollymont. That's the one in East Melbourne. So I went in and I got sat at a table, which was fine. But then he came out and said, Oh, I think you'd be able to see better from my room upstairs. So I thought, OK, I'll... Go, I'll go along with this for the time being. So he took me upstairs. 
then tried to kiss me and I sort of managed to fend that off. But then he got so engrossed with trying to get the TV to work and it wouldn't that he took me back downstairs so I could watch his performance from downstairs. (laughs) 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 So Uh, that was a lucky escape. Is this person still with us? I believe so. Oh, come on, we're we're naming names, uh, Gigi. No, 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 no. No, uh, Gigi's too much of a lady. What what about the initials? Um, oh. can't think of them. That's the problem. Since I had all those anaesthetics recently, mm. my memory's gone shot to pieces. Oh, if anyone's got a saucy story, we want names. <laughs> you want names? Of course. Uh, uh, I, uh, uh, he was a comedian in Sydney. Right. He used to come down to Melbourne. Oh, uh, were his initials J.H.? Oh, gosh, I can't remember. Oh, don't worry about it. I can't remember, yeah. but uh, yes, so that was a very funny incident. Oh, yes. and I thought, you know, how vain is he that he sort of suddenly forgets about me <laughs> or trying yeah. to kiss me, and because yeah. I thought, oh, well, uh-huh. as soon as he goes downstairs, but I can escape. He was a rotter and a cat, how daily, pure, simple... Yeah. Young Gigi being, you know, molested. Well, like almost, that. almost violated, I would say. Oh, yes, that's the word. Exactly. All right, Gigi, I'm glad you recovered. Thank you very much. And as I said, Andrew, it's great to have you back on the radio. Yeah, it Thank certainly you. is. Oh, oh, Gigi. Oh, good night, Gigi. I've seen some great acts at the old Clevedon room in the past. Yeah. Richard Clayton, the pianist. I saw Sammy Davis Jr. there put on an unbelievably good performance. I believe. He showed just how it should be done. I went there, yeah. I've said this before on radio, uh, I went there thinking, because it was a freebie, it was Radio, I got mm, tickets, yeah. And I thought, oh, you know, I don't know, Sammy Davis, he's all right, you know, a couple of records he moved out. I wasn't a huge fan. Came uh, away, well, it was a standing ovation. I was joining in, cause really. Was, and I'm sort of anti standing ovations because I think yeah. they're handled out too, too easily by mm, audiences. Yeah. But I was standing up. Uh, howling for him, as was the rest of the room, mm. and have been a big fan ever since. Ken mostly gives me one at midnight just to butter me up. It so f- <laughs> makes me feel good when I drive <laughs> away. <laughs> I tell you, I saw so, so the Cleveland room, Dion Warwick. Ah, yes, I saw her there too. Isaac so, Hayes, you I know, saw the Jack, shaft man. Yes, I saw... Oh, what was he like? Oh, a very good entertainer, oh yes. Was he good? At I, the piano, yes. Oh, I saw a whole night of shaft type. Oh, no, no, he was all right. Uh, also, who else did I... Oh, you know, so I think Andy Williams was there. Oh, yes. I saw Jack Jones there, too. Oh, was he good? Yes, I interviewed him, too, up in his room with the, the old Nagra tape recorder there. Oh, OK. And he was telling me how wonderful marriage was and, you know, devotion to his wife and I found true love. And he said, it's just a pity she can't be with me on this trip. Well, as I as he was talking to me, I could see into the bedroom of his suite and the door was slightly ajar and I saw a, a pair of very tanned, lovely young legs. They weren't his wife. <laughs> well, I don't, he just told me she w- couldn't come with him mm. on the trip and I saw these legs just going darting across the doorway oh. there. I thought, ooh, Mr Jones. Uh, and after the break, Andrew's going to tell you about the male entertainer he was interviewing who put a hand on his knee. Oh, no. Harvey Norman. You yeah, filthy swines, both of you. If ever I fluffed a word, which happened often, I always got a grunt from Bruce, which was very off-putting. Yes, and I, well... <laughs> yeah, uh, it's not amazing. I'm um, better happen to you too, and all performers, if you lose your nerve early on in a performance, for the rest of the night, you've lost it somehow, and you're fluffing your way through the night. Uh, but yes, it, you can. You sort of go feral from there on, don't yes, you? Yes. You can't seem to get back onto the ship. No, because you're concentrating, I can't do that again. And the worst offender was Graham Kennedy. Was he? If he had a bad night, like if he was doing opening remarks and the audience weren't reacting or the floor manager dropped the cue sheets with all his words on it, uh, you know, if he got off to a bad start, he could throw that show away and be quite mean for the rest of the night. Uh, that's, he shouldn't to, do to that. The I don't agree with and, that. No, but, but he did have his highs and lows. I never saw you wobble that cocoa mug uh, when you were saying goodnight to Channel 9 uh, viewers. No. It I, always was steady in your hand. Oh, yes. I was sober in those days. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, Tony's in Glen Iris. Hi, Tony. Hey, how are you? Thanks for waiting on. No, that's all right. Now, Phil, you said you wanted a tram. I used to know someone who actually had a red rattler train carriage in their back. Backyard. I've got no idea how they got it there. But he, oh, even, even better, Tony. Uh, even a seven carriage train, I'd love up the drive. Well, this was just one carriage. It was in the backyard, and I went to a birthday party in it when I was about in about grade six or something. Oh. 
So that was in uh, Glen Iris. So it's, I don't know if it's still there or not. I won't say which street. But no, um, and, and, you know, I used to see one. Bruce and I used to go down to Werribee Plaza Shopping Centre, and very close by was a tram, uh, no, a, a, a Red Rattler train in a, a park down there. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so they are around here and there. Tony, I've seen that old, that old vintage tram they have in Box Hill. I don't know if yeah, there's, there's one there in Whitehorse Road, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it, yeah. Uh, uh, Tony, uh, did you see, or Phil, too, did you see an article in the Herald Sun? It would have been early this week or late last week about a guy who wants to bring back a Red Rattler service as a touristy thing. Oh, yes, yes, that's on the cards, isn't it? To go to Belgrave and then from the, you go from your Red Rattler up the hills in Puffing Billy. Billy. To yeah. connect to Puffing Billy. Great idea, yes. Right. I hope it happens. Yeah, they still have those Red Rattler carriages around, yes. Now, the other thing, you, you mentioned Don McLean. I saw him about 10 or 15 years ago at the Palais Theatre. Yeah. And it was one of the strangest concerts I've ever been to because he just walked on the stage. He said, hello, Melbourne. He sat down and he played all his songs through, sort of note perfect, you know, Vincent Castles in the air and you know, it's just a son. And then he, um, he, he didn't say one word to the audience. He finished with American Pie, got up and just walked off. And that oh, was it. It was weird. just bizarre. Well, it was really odd. Well, no interaction with the audience? None. Nothing at all. Oh, that's... Not, and, and there was no, no um, you know, uh, encores or anything. He just no. finished with American Pie and off he went. Well, he's really a recording artist, isn't he, rather than a performer? Yes, please. You know, Paul Simon was a bit like that. I must say, I saw the Graceland tour, Tony, years ago. And a fabulous music. He had Lady Smith Mombatsa with him. You know, the whole ensemble, just yeah. like the album. Mm. But he, and, and he did, but he did say a few words between the songs. He'd say, this is one I, I've always liked and... Uh, you okay. know, and, and it first came to me when I was, you know, driving you a car. Or, to the song. Yeah, but you know, maybe only three lines, but at least he said something. Yeah. But, yeah. but to say nothing is really quite yeah. rude. Uh, yeah. I tell you, two performers very similar to that. Anne Murray from Canada was one, yeah. and and Roy Orbison would just say thank yeah, you yes, at the end of the song, thank you. you, and get on to the next song. But at the other end of the spectrum, Tony, there's nothing worse than an entertainer who talks all night That's true. And, and doesn't sing. Uh, Matt Munro was guilty of that, and other oh. people I know, and and. So I've seen him hit, so just would waffle and wander, you know? I believe Dean Martin, towards the end, was doing a lot of that. Yeah, just, yeah, just up on stage, just doing some stuff with the audience. Yeah. But in the end, he wasn't singing Valare or Everybody Loves Somebody. You, 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 you was, people were getting frustrated. Well, he do the first couple of lines and then oh, that, yes, throw that's the right. song yeah, away. Then, yeah. Uh, yes, can so, I, can so, I tell you, boys, in modern parlance, uh, saw ACDC when they were in town recently, which I think might have been just last year, uh, on the tour that's now postponed mm -hmm. on hold with uh, Brian Johnson, the yes. vocalist, having... I, I got you the tickets you to Ed Stadium. Stadium. Again, ACDC, Brian Johnson came on and said after about the second or third song, Hello Melbourne, and that is the only thing that was said from the stage oh. for the rest of the night. Now, how did the audience, the, the Akadaka audience, now, the take Ak that? The Akadaka audience, absolute diehards, and will tell you it's the greatest show they've ever seen in their life. I knew Brian Johnson was having issues because in between songs, there was gaps of between 20 and 30 and 40 seconds sometimes where the stage just went black, Nothing was said, Gee. everything was silent, and then they started up again with the next song. Now, you go and see the Rolling Stones, as I did, uh, well, as I had many times, but recently when they were in town, Mick Jagger, it was as though he had a comedy writer. He was doing gags about Bryn Edelston and mm. Dr. Jeffrey and Gabby oh, Greco. Really? I, I saw that. I was there yep, then. Talking, oh, talking, I, remember the, I remember the Edelston jokes. Yeah. Yes, and said he loved it so much in, Mel uh, in Melbourne. He was thinking about giving the rock and roll game away and becoming a barista in Brighton. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he had the audience, in the, and that is why the Rolling Stones continued to be the greatest Mm. rock and roll band in the world and ACDC mm. Well, probably just down the list because they don't have that connection with the audience as you've yeah. mentioned so many is, of those Isn't Mick clever to do yeah. that? Do you yeah. think we'll see the Stones here again? Oh, absolutely. You reckon they'll come out? Yeah, people say, well, oh, they're in their 70s now. You've got to remember, and remember this one, Tony, the Rolling Stones heroes are the blues legends who played on and on until their 80s and 90s until they dropped dead. And mm. Keith Richards has said his aim in life is to keep playing until one day somebody has to hand the ticket back and get a refund. Because well, that's, 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 that's the big question mark. How long will Keith last? Oh, it'll Keith will outlast us all. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> In some sort of desiccated state. Pretty much. Well, pretty much so, like he is now. Uh, don't he's, go, an, he's an absolute legend, isn't he? Absolutely. Hey, Tony, don't go away. Uh, Ken has given me a price list, but I'm sure we have a $50 pancake parlour oh, voucher there. Thank you. If, if not, I'll shout you. <laughs> and that's a pancake parlour, Malvern East and Doncaster, <laughs> and it's lovely. Uh, now, Ken, I think you said the ACDC concert you saw was in your words, disappointing. Our boss, Stephen Beer, said it was awfully loud. Uh, just give us 
an analysis of the night. Was it as good as they'd been in the past? No, purely because there was those massive gaps. Uh, I'll tell you, the, the, they were incredible. They are fantastic. You know, they're not young guys. They sounded fantastic. OK, Brian Johnson's voice wasn't 100% there, but he's singing songs that he sang mm -hmm. originally 30 years ago. Yeah. But they had those massive gaps of nothing between songs where the show just lost total well, momentum. Well, you know, and Mariah Carey did the same thing, Eddie. Yeah. Ed. When she was, she would take selfies, Andy. She would sing a song, and then she'd say, "I want to do some selfies with the audience." And often there was two or three minutes between her songs, like the show was under rehearsed. You, you, you could not fault ACDC's musicianship; it was incredible. The show itself was amazing. Mm. But to have gaps of yeah. nothing, you lose momentum. They have no interaction with the audience. How Hello Melbourne all. was about it, was it? Hello Melbourne was the only thing that was said. Oh. And oh, also, you, they've come to town without, of course, without uh, Bon Scott, who passed away back in 1980, yeah. but also without Malcolm Young, who, with his brother Angus, oh. formed the band. Angus Young is now the only original member on stage. Mm, yeah. To not make any sort of mention of your history, of your connection with mm, Melbourne, no, no. it's just ignoring, it's right. it's no. ignoring no. every legacy that the audience yeah. is there built on. So right. you just can't do it. Hey, no. Tony, hang on for that pancake, pal about you. Folks, you're listening to The Billy Pennell Show. 14 to 11, Nightline, Andrew McLaren filling in for Simon Owens for this last night with Phil Brady. And from the Herald Sun, Michelle Ainsworth, a very good evening to you, Michelle. Good evening to you. What is in the paper tomorrow? Uh, so tomorrow uh, on the front page we have the latest from Beirut where the 60 Minutes team are uh, currently, as we speak, standing in front of a... a uh, courtroom uh, trying to figure out a way to, to get out of the, uh, the case over in, in Beirut. As I heard someone tonight on the news say that if they do some grovelling they probably won't really be heavily penalised. Is there a reference to that in the article tomorrow in the paper? Do you know in the Herald Sun? What we have tomorrow, we have some exclusive words from Tara Brown. Uh, just a couple of quick comments that she made to our reporter on the on the scene down there, um, over there, who, and she has just basically said that she doesn't really know a lot of what's going on. Um, and what seems to be coming out of the court tonight is that perhaps if the mother of the children involved is able to come to a deal with her ex-partner, the father, uh, that could see the crew treated a lot better and her case actually totally removed from the court. So it, it could come down to a deal between the mum and dad. Uh, what else in the paper tomorrow, uh, Michelle? Uh, so tomorrow we also have a story on the hepatitis B scare at a Melbourne hospital. So the health department has sent letter to 654 patients uh, as a precautionary measure asking that they have blood tests after a healthcare worker at a hospital was diagnosed with hepatitis B. Thank you very much, Michelle. Michelle Ainsworth from the Herald Sun is available, of course, from about midnight tonight. Yes, and there'll be the hit lift out tomorrow too, oh, yes. telling you what gigs are on around town, uh, CD <laughs> reviews, yeah. movies. I know you want to line up your gigs for the weekend, don't you? Yeah, my next gig is Air Supply at the Palais on the 8th of uh, June. Thank you very much. Are you going along? I'm an old rock and roller, you know that. Well, I don't know if Air Supply are exactly hardcore heavy metal, but no, it's um, good to see you supporting local talent there. And maybe Lois of Frankston would like to come with me. Hello, Lois. Hello, Phil. Hello, Andy, Andy. Hello, Lois. Uh, hello. Uh, sorry. I'm sorry. Why? Why are you sorry? I can't get me bread properly. Well, well, maybe it's not the night to talk to us. I don't want you to be distressed. I don't want you to go away. I want to speak. I, I've been hanging on for ages. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, I, I want to say thank you to Norma for her lovely card today. Mm -hmm. And hello, Brucey boy. Yes. You look after yourself, me mate. Mm. We all look at, we're all waiting for you to come back. Of course we are. And I miss you. Yeah. I miss all of you, poor little bit. Yeah. Last week, Phil, I could 
like, no, when you up, Chris, I couldn't even talk. No, even tonight you're struggling. Yeah. Thank you for making the effort, Lois. Thank you, boys. All right, and take care of yourself. Keep taking your medication, won't you? We worry about you, and we love you, Lois. And yeah. thank you for making the effort tonight. It was a bit of a struggle for her, I yes, think. Yes, Lois is uh, suffering, isn't she? Uh, Shane, good morning. Good evening to you, Shane. Hello. Yes, go ahead, Shane. You're on Nightline. Hello. Yeah, you're on Nightline, Shane. Yeah, mate. Yeah, I, I, I tried to get through the other night and um, talk to Simon when he asked about your best mates. Yeah. And um, I never got put on air. Well, you're on, you're on air now. What, what can we do for you? Well, my best mate ever in my life has been my father and still is my best mate. That's good to hear. And um, my sons and everything, they're just my best mates. Did you tell us this the other night? It sounds very familiar. Pardon? Did you tell us this the other night? It sounds very familiar. Yeah, uh, I did, but I never got on air. Yeah, oh, never... yeah. Yes, you did. Oh, absolutely, Shane. You were talking to Simon and myself, and uh, we said good on you for feeling so strongly about your dad and, I think, uh, your three sons. It's it's 9 to 11 already. We'll take a break, and, and then, Andy, we're coming back with The Passing Parade. The Phil, Phil, what do you think of the new banknotes that are coming our way? A bit wishy-washy. Someone described the wattle as looking like toilet brushes. It does, too. It does. I, why do they change it? I they, don't know. Why change... And apparently, this is the beginning, they're going to change them all. It's not yeah. just the, the fives, it's the 10s and the 50s, etc. I think they're making them more secure, for one Oh, is that it? But it's, why change the pattern? Mm. We've had, I, I just don't see the reason. I, 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 other people like it. I know it's been discussed a bit on air, but maybe after 11 o'clock, after news and all that, we can uh, get some opinions on that. I like the American way where they have the same banknotes and they haven't changed them in a hundred years. I agree, couldn't they, agree more. They, all their banknotes are the same colour and the same size. That's so a, that is you wrong. have to peel them off carefully in, yeah. a, in a dark taxi. That but I don't they, agree with. They still have their $1 bill. Yes. They still have a $2 That's bill. Right. They have a $5 bill. And they've had these ever since I went to America 50 years ago. And they just haven't changed their currency. If you've got thoughts about that, give, give us a call please here on 9696900693 why why should we change those 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 banknotes we've got leave them alone now. let's have a little history you know so for future generations I like America they still have miles instead of kilometers <laughs> yes, that's they right. still do their temperature in Fahrenheit oh, like centigrade it, that's right but uh, rather annoyingly they've still got cents and, and five cent coins you know the, and those cent coins they're really ridiculous they do weigh you down a bit Hello don't again. they this is John Doremus with a passing parade of the story of Elizabeth Patterson the American beauty, who won the heart and hand of Napoleon Bonaparte's shiftless brother, Prince Jerome. I'll be back to tell you of this romantic but ill-fated interlude in the stormy annals of the Bonaparte family after this message. An Irish migrant who made a fortune in the War of Independence. Elizabeth Patterson was born in Baltimore on February 6, 1785. She grew into a breathtaking beauty with a keen wit and a sharp tongue. In July of 1803, when she was 18, fate cast a handsome 19-year-old French naval officer on the coast of America. He was Jerome Bonaparte, the youngest brother of the invincible Napoleon, soon to be hailed Emperor of the French. Jerome had been cruising with a French squadron in the West Indies. Following a violent outbreak of yellow fever on board, he was sent for his health's sake to neutral America to wait passage back to France. On July 20th, 1803, Jerome stepped ashore at Norfolk, Virginia, and proceeded to Baltimore. The French consul in Washington was anxious to get him out of the country as soon as possible. Notorious for his addiction to wine, women, and song, Jerome was no particular credit to his illustrious brother. An American ship was chartered to transport him back to France. But at the last minute, he abruptly refused to sail. The reason for this was because he had fallen wildly in love with the Belle of Baltimore, Elizabeth Patterson. So infatuated was he with her that when she refused to become his mistress and made it clear that it was marriage or nothing, he yielded to her ultimatum and on Christmas Eve of 1803 they were married. 
When the news reached Napoleon, he exploded with rage. And at once dispatched the French frigates Didon and Cybele with orders to bring back Jerome alone. Meantime, the prince and his bride took themselves to Washington, where they rented a house near the capital. President Jefferson received them kindly, and society flung open its doors to the romantic pair. In May of 1804, Napoleon was crowned Emperor of France. Bogged down with debts and eager to share the imperial splendor, Jerome was convinced he could soften his brother's heart with a sight of the radiant Elizabeth. But the captains of the Didon and Cybele refused to allow her on board. The known neutral skipper would run the risk of incurring Napoleon's ire by transporting her to Europe. And so at length, early in 1805, Elizabeth's father placed one of his own ships at their disposal. But when they arrived in Lisbon, Napoleon saw to it that Elizabeth was prevented from disembarking. In the end, Jerome was forced to leave her on board and proceed to Italy, where he was confronted by his furious brother and promptly dispatched to command a warship in the Mediterranean. In due course, Napoleon had the marriage declared null and void, and Elizabeth was left with no option but to return to Baltimore. American society recognized her as the Princess Bonaparte, despite the dissolution of the Union. And to this day, Baltimore still has among its citizens some who bear the proud name of Bonaparte. Our time is up till we meet again for another chapter in the Passing Parade. This is John Doremus. As always, thank you so much. And goodbye. And uh, Andy, we've got Chris Godfrey at the Bureau. Hi, Chris. How are you? Yeah, good evening, gentlemen. How are you both? Gee, it was a nice afternoon, wasn't it? It was a great day to be out in the bed, actually. I was uh, cruising around the uh, metropolis shopping for uh, furniture. So, uh, oh, yes. Certainly was, yeah. So, it, so at, 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 at least the process of trying to get these things into the trailer wasn't too far. Well, are you moving way. house, are you? Oh, no, no, no. We're just, just uh, looking for a few things. To, okay. Uh, Yes, just to, uh, we've had an old cat sitting which has had about uh, seven years' worth of kids jumping up and down on the... Oh. Mm. Well, well, there's That's always, great, there's always buy, swap and sell on the Saturday or Sunday morning <laughs> on 3AW. <laughs> uh, now, let's talk about the weather, please. Certainly. Well, uh, we did reach uh, 20.0 to today, uh, and even 20, and uh, mainly sunny, uh, with gen generally a fairly light southerly wind, and uh, the fine weather is set to continue at least for the next... A uh, couple of days, and if anything, it's going to become somewhat warm, at least for this time of year. Um, after a minimum of e um, a minimum of 11 um, overnight tonight, um, we we'll, might start the day with light winds and even maybe a few patches of fog around the outer suburbs tomorrow morning, and then we'll rise to a maximum of 25 during the afternoon as uh, light winds start to become northerly. Although, if you are near the bay during the afternoon, you, you will pick up a bit of a, a breeze coming off the bay, which will temper con, uh, conditions somewhat. So I think across the whole of Melbourne, it's going to be uh, a great day to be out and about once again. Oh, beautiful. Uh, and how about yeah. Friday into the weekend, please? Well, uh, continuing warm, so uh, 14 to 25 on um, fr Friday. Once again, the winds will be north to northwesterly. Uh, we will have a weak cold front which will cross the state to start the weekend. Uh, it might just bring a few showers, but not really high rain totals. So 13 to 19 on Saturday with just that medium chance of showers which will clear later in the day and then as we move on to Sunday 12 to uh, 19 with maybe just the slight chance of a shower um, hanging around Melbourne as winds stay south to southwesterly and then as we uh, start next week uh, we start to warm once again so 22 on Whoa, Monday God. 23 on Tuesday and 24 on Wednesday no rain we want rain we want rain we want rain hey eh, Chris yeah, I think a little bit more rain would be uh, welcome. That uh, nice drink we had about just a little bit over a week ago, I think, has already worn off. But uh, I think we're going to have to wait a little bit longer, at least uh, um, beyond the edge of the uh, for forecast period until we start to see some more meaningful rain. So, OK, uh, well, thanks for that. It's very uh, promising weather-wise. And uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow night, Chris. Thanks a lot, Phil. We'll see you then. All right. And here's Andrew McCurran to welcome our country friends. <laughs> yes, listening through the three and a 
Wangaratta and 2QN in lovely Daniloquin. How long since you've been to Daniloquin? I've never been there. My I've whole been, life. but it would be since I was a kid. I'm sad to say, and I apologise to those listening in Denny right now, but it was a great town. But I used to go with Dad when he was a commercial traveller. Oh, okay. And he, one of his uh, spots he used to call, one of the towns he used to call in uh, when I was on school holidays, and I'd travel around with him for a week in the country, uh, was Daniloquin. It was always oh, a yeah. great place. I, I know uh, Wangaratta well, but yeah, I've been over the board here. Oh, by the way, if you think I'm talking to you through smudge glasses, feel that. It's just that Oro decided to chew the glasses. Oh, look at Just feel them. Oh, he's, the... he's chewed his way through the lens. Yeah, how do you see and, and, through those? And at the back, have a look where he's pulled off the little prong that goes oh, over the is. air. And, <laughs> Are they expensive ones? And I found both lenses in the garden and the frames oh, uh, hanging loose. Yeah. But uh, they're the joys of, of having dogs. Uh, do you have an agenda? Anything you'd like to raise? Well, I was talking about the uh, pro or con, the, uh, the, the, the new notes we're, we're having inflicted upon us for no particular reason. Well, the new designs, I can understand mm. they're upgrading the security, and that's fine. Yeah. But why do you have to change the designs? Can't we leave anything just the same? Banknotes no, don't no, have to change. In Australia, we, we have to move on all the time. To me, and needlessly. And it'll, be, it'll be a huge expense, too, yes. to print the new notes. Uh, what do you think? Give us a call about that, please. Am I wrong or am I right? Or am I just mm. being a fuddy daddy? No, no? I, I'm with you, Andrew. I don't know why we have to change. And two, I don't like the new design. No, that, that's the second point. But to me, to even change at all is why is, it's unnecessary. As you say, is if they can do a security upgrade, fair enough. But mm. it just incorporate it into what we have yeah. and just continue on. Why do we need to spend money and, needlessly? And yet we change our stamps all the time. What's the difference? Oh, yeah, the stamps. Well, that's a whole different why? issue. Dude. Why is it different? Well, that would be. Well, that's a point. It would be a lot cheaper to why change not, the stamp. Why not year after year keep the same stamps? Well, there's a good point. Actually, Phil, you raise the point. Why do we bother to change stamps? Yeah, yeah. The, the uh, value of them doesn't yeah, change. The, the difference is, you see, that there are stamp collectors. If I look around <laughs> the room here tonight, there's only one person I can see who collects money. And that is <laughs> and it's not Andrew McLaren. No, and it's not Ken. No, <laughs> it's no, buddy. I spend it. I am Mr. Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I spend it. I'm anonymous. <laughs> that's, oh, that's, uh, people never know of your charitable works. Is that it, is it? Oh, absolutely. All right. You'll only find out after I've left you all. <laughs> Yes, that I was a philanthropist. Uh, well, we, we hope for a little bequest in the will. Yeah, hey, oh, what would the will pop down to that address he gave us earlier in queue and pay him a visit? Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah, me and Dame Elizabeth. And, uh, Cameron Zaberg has been waiting on. Hi, Cameron. Oh, good evening, uh, Philip, and good evening to the Kensters, and uh, welcome back, Uncle Andy. And, Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Cam. And all the best, of course, to Bors and to Jill, who would be tucked away nice and comfy in bed by now at... Dare say, and on the uh, the new bills, it's a five dollar bill that's coming in September. I didn't see. Was it in, in the uh, Herald Sun? Was it? Uh yeah, there's yes, in the paper well. this morning. Uh, yeah. there, there was a time when you weren't allowed to photograph uh, banknotes. Is that true? It was illegal, but, you know, in the event that someone counterfeited it. Is Fred Hollows on it, uh, Philip? No, no, the Queen is still there. Oh, for, for some that. reason, there's this series of uh, toilet rolls, as, uh, toilet brushes, as has been commented on by Phil, uh, being put down the middle of the $5 note. And it's that's just... actually what we think, Cameron. So that so they'll phase in all the other notes over over the other all the other bills yeah, over, eventually over, yes over a, probably a two year period yes. and, and I reckon the two hundred dollar bill will be the last one that'll come that yeah. that's uh, that's a, that's going oh. to enjoy it. it's already been talked about so it won't mm. be anything more than yeah, that with inflation it'll have to happen won't it it'll yeah. happen eventually yeah. because there's already a two hundred dollar bill and a five hundred dollar bill in the euros as well oh I think uh, you're right yes and and, uh, and uh, Philip you're going to Columbia Beer, are you? I, uh, there's a chance I will be in September to a wedding, yes, Cameron. Okay, you're not going to Brazil for the uh, Olympics? No, no, I, I said the London Olympics, you might recall, and the LA Olympics. No, I'll give them a miss, thank you. Oh, okay, all right, so you're just to Columbia this year. Yeah, can, can somebody give me the starting date of the Rio Olympics? I'd like to make a note of that. In August sometime. Yes, I always enjoy the opening yeah. ceremony. All right, all the best, boys, and hooroo, Uncle Andy. Thank you very much, Cameron. Uh, Ron's at Fairfield. Hello, Ron. Yeah, not bad, thank you. Good. Yeah, I've got a, a sign here, you talk about mileage and that. Mm. At, on the rail, there was... I've got a sign here, it's 25 miles to Griffiths Tees. That's right, I remember that well, yeah. Yeah, it's a long time ago. Oh, yes. And I've got also, I've got uh, the first $5 notes that come out. Oh. They've never been 
never been handled. Oh, they're mint. And they're, um, they're Commonwealth of Australia. How many do you have? About 15. Oh, and uh, did you collect them for your children or why? No, myself. Uh, they could be quite valuable. Yeah, well, I don't know. I, I heard you today. I've got those, you know, those round $50 coins. 50, 50, 50, no, no, 50 cent, 50 cent pieces. No, 50, 50 cents, yeah. Yeah. Now, I've got about 15 of them, and they're worth 10 bucks each. Okay. Yeah, you want to go along to Shield Stamps and Coins if you live uh, in Melbourne. Yeah, you do too. You're at uh, Fair Fairfield. It's not that far away from you. And uh, Shield Stamps and Coins in uh, Rosanna, Ivanhoe, around there. Anyway, uh, and uh, see what the uh, the five dollar notes are worth. They're worth more than face value. I'll tell you that if they're mint. Hey, good luck to you, Ron. Yeah, good to hear from you. Out to Laylor now. Yes, and Bernard's in Laylor. Hello, Bernard. Gentlemen, good evening. Good day. Can you cross back your memory from the seventies? A Malaysian prince came and kidnapped his two daughters, remember? Yes, I do. His son and his daughter. Yes. Uh, I'm from Malaysia. Mm. He's in the state of Pahang, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. He's a prince of that state. You know, about 40 years ago, yes. Uh, that's right. Uh, did they go and intervene in Malaysia? What's your question? Uh, did they go and intervene in Malaysia? Oh, I, I can't recall now. That's right, and uh, there, that was quite a case, wasn't it? The, the, That's right. The lady, the mother, wrote a book, and uh, she appeared on TV. Uh, and and uh, she, is, she was married to one of your journalists, I think. And I You're think right. she's from Melbourne, because I yeah. met her in the post office in Riversdale Road, Hawthorne, on one mm. occasion. And talking about Don Lean, uh, Don McLean, mm. I sang the song, uh, Just the Sun, to your beautiful Su Susie Wilkes. And yeah. only sickly show some years ago. Okay. Just the sun shining in your eyes, just the moon in the skies, the sun and the moon and the wind and you and I. Oh. Thank you, gentlemen. How pretty. Thank you, Bernard, and good night. We're Aaron filling in for Simon Owens on Nightline tonight and love your calls on 96 900 693. 96 900 693 if you've got something on your mind. Uh, Karen's at Sunshine. Hello, Karen. Andrew and Phil. G'day, what's on your list tonight? Um, well, the Queen turns 90 um, in 21st of April. Yes. She celebrates it in June. But um, I remember back in primary school we used to sing um, God Save Our Gracious Queen, Long Live Our Gracious Queen, whatever we used to sing. No, uh, noble Queen, I think it was. Noble Queen, yeah. But Long Live Her, I think God was listening. <laughs> but she certainly reached the right old age. Isn't it wonderful? Yeah, it's good, isn't it? And she, yes. she loves the social media. She's on that all the time. Oh, yes. But, um, I was going to say that um, Prince, Prince William and Kate are in India, and they're visiting all these places. But Kate, Kate also plans to visit the slums and play with all the kids. That's a, Well, that's very noble. Yeah, I mean, Lady Di used to do a lot of that sort of thing, didn't she, when she was alive? Yes, yeah, she did, and so did Mother Teresa. Yeah, and um, the other thing I was going to say is um, North Korea, I don't know if you heard or not, but North Korea has developed a secret nuclear weapon. Oh, maybe, right? maybe. It's all propaganda. Oh, is it? Oh, I think oh, so. I didn't know that, because I reckon it was able to reach um, mm. America. Yeah. Uh, I, hope, I hope he doesn't get drunk one night. <laughs> no, I, I, look, I think he's all talk, that man. I hope, so, I hope, I hope he, he is, is, yes. All right, Karen, always enjoy your calls. Right. Now, here's the birthday girl who, no secret, turned 94 today. Hello, Queenie. Hello, dear Phil. I'm 95, love. Hello, oh, you're, Andy Pandy. Well, you're a year, a year older than Ron Blaskett. Yes. Did you tell Ron that I was the same age as him? And that you celebrate on the same day. Yes. Yeah. Well, look, I had a perfect... Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Queenie. Oh, you're rotten, you lot. Uh -huh. Anyway, uh, uh, what I wanted to say was, I wanted to say to all the Nightline people that were on Facebook and the love and greetings that they gave me, I'd like to thank all of them. And please, Lois, please, please, Lois, don't ring love like that because you are only just making yourself worse. You've got to get better. Um, and uh, as far Andy... Yes? The note. Ah, uh, if I was the Queen, I would burn a lot of those because she looks terrible. Why they... Look, what's 
this business about changing everything. Why can't we leave well enough alone? It is not broken, don't fix it. And I think this, that bottle, you're right, and there's a little bird somewhere in it. Oh, it is a shocking note. I wonder what, it is coloured pink like the others, isn't it? Uh, well, yes, it has some pink in it now. I don't remember it having so much pink before, but... Ah, terrible. Anyway, Phil, I had a, a lovely uh, certificate from Heidi. I heard her on the air last night with you, and so did a lot of other people on Facebook. So I feel very humble today because of all these lovely people that came up to me and one I told you today, she thought it was a privilege to meet me. I'm going to start and, and make them pay to come and see me. No, no, I think you should have your own fan club. Yes, I think I should, Phil. And, and, you know, charge for selfies, absolutely, Queenie. Yes, well, that's what I should have done because she took a selfie of me. Roz, her name was, and I'd like you to say hello to Roz and her daughter. Her daughter's 40 and she listens and loves to see me come on. I don't know why, Andy. Is it your voice and my voice? I think it's your commanding presence, Queenie. You are the queen of all you survey. You are Her Highness. You are the one. Right. <laughs> you and Brad Philip, sirs, I'm an HRH. I'm going to dub you both a sir. I haven't got a, I haven't got a long enough sword from here. No, 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 you, you miss a point. No, I'm wanting an Australia Day Award next January, and Andy's after a Queen's Birthday Award in June. No, I'll take a sir. No, I don't mind. <laughs> they didn't go down too well when Tony was handing them out. Well, no, they've been locked. They don't exist anymore, Queenie. Well, that was only a brief little return, wasn't it? Yeah. Anyway, but thank you, Queenie. And did you receive any fabulous presents? Yes, I did. My daughter brought me in this great big parcel, and I wondered what it was. And it was a beautiful... A bag that, oh, well, you know what women like with things in their bags. Well, mine was never big enough. It's all something I've got down in the bottom of it. Yeah. And she bought me the lovely bag and, oh, I got a nice scarf. I got some money and I got, uh, mm. oh, I've got a lot of things. I'm going yeah. to see singing in the rain. Okay, well, well, here's something else you've got to. Andrew and I, on your 95th birthday, want you to have a gift from Karen at Warner Brothers Music. The glory days of Aussie pub rock, four CDs <laughs> with songs from the 70s, oh. 80s and beyond yeah. in stores now. <laughs> uh, something to sing along to, <laughs> Queenie. Yeah, with madness. <laughs> And Daka Daka, yeah. the angels. Oh, <laughs> roast, you got some rose tattoo oh, there. The tats, yeah, <laughs> Take oh. it back to your days at the Burvale. Eh? <laughs> Midnight oil, it's all there. Oh, yeah. Midnight oil, you can forget about him. Okay, you enjoy, Quinny. That's yeah. your reward. All right, then I'll wait for ten, will I? You yeah, uh, wait for me, Queenie. I'll come back to you. Tell you all about the rosy tats. And we all love you, Queenie. Yeah. Yeah. Happy birthday, bye. Oh, man, oh, man. <laughs> uh, could only happen on Nightline. Uh, Josie, uh, good evening to you. Hi, how are you guys? G'day, Josie. Hang on, I'll just take you off the speaker. Yes, I'll please. In, in right. Okay. Um, I went to set, uh, last Saturday night, because I don't really don't go much out anywhere, but last Saturday night just passed... I was um, at a special event. It was a, a Muslim convert thing, and it was—it's a very big society called Benevolence. Anyway, and I went along with my um, with my girlfriend, and um, and I've never been to one of these things before. And um, um, and it was so it was their first one for the year, and it was in the lower temple area at this place, and there was a guest speaker, and. Um, I knew that who the guest speaker was going to be for the night and everything, and it turned out to be the guest speaker is was which we met and had photographs and spoke and everything with his wife, family, and kids, and all that thing. Walid Ali. Wow, that's uh, kind of impressive, isn't it? Very, very big, and he did a he he did a speech, a talk for the night, yes. and. Um, he um, he went. He spoke for about an hour and a half, and an hour and a half. That long, I, I, roughly about an hour and a half. That's a long speech. Yes, and um, oh, he sees the most 
um, down to earth guy. Um, I told him, I said, look, I'm a Richmond sport, same as you, and good luck for your Gold Logie nomination. Hope you get mm -hmm. it because you know Philip because you know you've been in the Gold Logies and things like that. And and of course you, I know you from before, and you know me, and from before, and you know, um, I, I tell you what, um, Andrew and Philip, um, if he wins the Gold Logie, he's going to be the first um, uh, Muslim, uh, you know, that is a big thing because everyone's talking about this subject. He's going to be the first Muslim guy, and he's so groovy personality as he is anyway, as we all know. He's going to be the first Muslim guy to win the gold Logie. And I said to him, and I said to him, you know what, sweetie, uh, Walid, if Barack Obama can be the first black president um, ever in, a, in United States history, well, you know what? You can be the first um, uh, first generation, you know, from immigrant parents because he's, he's Egyptian Muslim, um, to win a gold logie. Um, I hope that he wins because the voting's have all been closed. Oh, uh, yeah. Say. Well, they, uh, there's every chance he will. Uh, just as uh, Hillary Clinton could well become the first female president of the USA. She's in with a chance. Thank you, uh, Josie. That was a very passionate phone call. Yes, it's 11.30. This is Nightline. Uh, through until midnight, just before we break, and uh, Norma and Robin were coming to you and all the rest. Uh, the very first Logies were held at the Brighton Savoy Hotel. Yes. And you were probably, were you a guest at the very early ones? The year was 1959. and I, They I, weren't I, telecast in those days. No, and I think it was called the uh, uh, International, or it might be the International in Brighton these days. Yes, but I think it was called the Savoy Hotel on, on the beach at Brighton, yeah. on the Esplanade of Brighton. Yes. A very small affair. I've seen some photos taken on the night. Right. It was, it was, shall we say, modest by oh, yeah. today's standards. And it's just rather sweet to see the photos. There's about sort of oh, 80 people in the audience. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it wasn't televised. I think the results were in TV Week about a week later. That's right. Yeah, it, it very, a very low-key beginning. They're just you, especially the teal. Do you uh, still wear those jackets with the uh, leather elbows? Uh, the patches, oh yes, very oh, no. much so. The coat man always installs them for me, and he puts patches elsewhere too, but I won't go into detail. And do you wear three-piece suits at all with a, with a waistcoat leather? Yes, yes. You, you're well. very old-fashioned, aren't well, you? Well, I'm traditional. I, I enjoy traditional things. Mm, it's like you've just come from Gosford Park. <laughs> <laughs> via Downton Abbey. Visit the Coat Man's new location. It's at 595 Glen Huntley Road in Elstwick, near the corner of Kooyong Road. You can't miss it. They're open five days, Mondays and Tuesdays, 10 till 4. I'm not sure about those spats. <laughs> uh, they're open tomorrow, Thursday, from noon till 8pm. Fridays, 10 till 2. And today... Sundays. No, no, Sunday is four days away. Yes, that's four days away. But I think of it always as today. <laughs> the well, Sabbath. You out the better thing. Uh, <laughs> Sundays 11 till 4. We'll do them again. Mondays and Tuesdays, 10 till 4. Thursdays 12 till 8. Fridays 10 till 2. And Sundays 11 till 4. Visit the easy to navigate website, coatman.com.au. Wonderful, the Coatman. And, and like Bruce and myself, more than, and Simon, more than 60% of their customers, it's repeat business. And why not? Not. Yes, yes, so it be. Yeah, terrific and very generous too. Very yeah, nice people. Yeah. Uh, I won't go into details there. They wouldn't want it. Bless you, Nora, and bless you, Moisha. Twenty-five to twelve. Nightline. Norma is at Briar Hill. Hello, Norma. Hi, Phil and Andrew. Good day, Norma. Now, Andrew, thank you for filling in while um, Simon's been unavailable. Well, you're thank you for thanking me. You're a re becoming a real handy Andy. Yes, I know. They, right. As they say, they just call. and they, Well, no, they don't these days. Everything's email. I get emails saying, would you please fill in here? And would you fill in there? And I say, yes, sir. Any time. Oh. Three bags full, sir. Oh, it comes in handy, doesn't it? Well, yeah, it does. A few extra, Bob. Now, listen, uh, Phil, uh, I'd like to wish Queenie happy birthday. She's a legend, isn't she? Of course. Uh, and also, um, and good luck to Lois. And you you be strong there, Lois. And uh, we're thinking of you, Dan. And Phil, yeah. uh, Tom Jones has had a, a lot of sadness with his wife passing yes, away. Yes, I know that. And I asked Ken if he could play a little bit of um, what's up, pussy cat. Well, I may be into the commercial break because we don't want to break the flow with music. So, Ken, if you can find the song the next time we take a break. Uh, why that song is hardly appropriate when he's mourning. Yeah. 
Why, why, why a happy song like that when he's so sad? Okay. Well, no, well, but why, why that song? Yeah, oh, well, I just like it. <laughs> okay. Well, what's the I, I don't think it has any connection with his wife passing away. I oh, know. Maybe I he called her Pussycat. Because mm. he's been on the news. That was oh, I don't know if you heard us, Kim, but into the break, please, a few bars of what's new Pussycat. Oh, okay. Yes, you're welcome, Norma. I think you think you're talking to Billy Pennell. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's it. Bye. Well, you're as nice as Billy Pennell. I'll try to be. Bye, darling. Okay. Robin of Box Hill, welcome. Well, hello there, Philip, and hello, Andrew. Now, I, I understand you have some good news, but are you willing to share it with us yet? Um, what do you think? Oh, I think you should. Okay. No time like the present. <laughs> well, all that talk of that last night, I was I was working at my computer and I was listening and hearing about the kilts and the and all sorts of things. And Can you speak uh, speak up a bit, please, Robin? Are you on the hands free? Yeah, I uh, know. I'm on my phone. Okay, that that's better? that's better. Yep. Yeah. Um, all that talk about kilts and things last night, and then tonight you were talking about ACDC, and a few weeks back we were talking, and you asked me if I would write a song for Bruce. Well, I have written a song for Bruce. Yes. And um, it got to a very rousing chorus, and I remembered one night talking to Bruce online, and he said that he had. Uh, Celtic background from Cornwall and I thought well look this chorus needs a bagpipe so I got in touch with you and we sort of crossed over we ended up with the same bagpiper a man called Ian Stewart who was one of the original bagpipers who played with ACDC in um, It's a Long Way to the Top and he has come into the studio and put his bagpipes down and we also had a, a man who um, collaborated with me once before on a track, I Can Dream, Can't I, from Paris, France, who did some bagpiping. And for the first time ever, um, I've played banjo. And so it's a, it's a full production, and it's called Song for Bruce, and it's on its way to you as I speak. Well, how exciting is that, Robin, and how thoughtful of you. How very touching, Robin. Thank you very much. That's okay. I just hope you like the song, and mo most of all, that Bruce gets to hear it and that he likes it, and it gives him an uplifting, inspiring feeling, and we have right. him back soon. And maybe, I don't know, I, I see Bruce uh, every week or so, maybe you can send me two copies, one we can keep in our library here, and one I can give to Bruce to play for the grandchildren, huh? Yes. Certainly, certainly. So. Oh, how wonderful, Robin. Can't wait to hear the song for Bruce. All right. Well, um, I hope you do, and, and I hope that, um, you know, it, it has the effect of just it's such a healing thing. I actually mm. played a little bit of it to one of our um, patients at work, yes. Andy Emerus, who was uh, very taken with the, with the chorus as well. Oh, well. And was Chris involved with it? Yes, Chris did all the engineering, and mm. she plays flute on it. Yeah. Um, so it's um, it's all the lyrics are all about all the things that Bruce does and talks about and, and um, you know, how he, he reaches the people and everything. So okay, well, I've had a wonderful thought. It's Bruce's birthday on the 24th of April, the eve of Anzac Day. Oh, it is too, yes. And Bruce will be 72 uh, that day, and I think that might be the night to launch it. Oh, okay. That's a Sunday, isn't it? Well, it's only 10 days away. Okay. All right, Robin, make sure we get it. And, and Robin, uh, you're an absolute treasure for doing it. Oh, that look, that's my pleasure, and, and I just hope it, it inspires Bruce because um, mm -hmm. you know, he needs... He needs that, and I think that it will lift him up and he'll get out of that bed and you'll see him coming up those stairs to uh, the radio station. Well, let's hope so. And speaking of music, here's that song. For well, gee, you never know who's going to ring up. Could be Jerry and the Pacemakers or Mick Jagger, but now it's Tony Orlando in Florida. <laughs> Hello, Tony. Good morning or good evening to you people. Oh, you're not Tony Orlando from Dawn. No, you're Tony in Orlando. Yeah, we're uh, just here in holidays. Actually, we got back next weekend. And, you've uh, been, you've been to Disneyland or Disney World, have you? Uh, yes, we've been to Universal Studios and uh, Sacramento also. Okay. Yeah, I, Phil, I couldn't disagree more with you than, than talking about uh, the American money. They're all the same size, they're made of paper. Uh, I've been carrying around an Australian $10 note in my wallet for the last four weeks, and anybody that sees it say, gee, what's that? And I explained to them that it was an invention by the CSIRO, or plastic notes. Uh, and they agreed that they're colourful, but the fact that mm, the American money is, oh, it was one dollar, exactly the same size. 
and I couldn't disagree with you more. However, <laughs> yeah, but in, in fairness, I mean, if you're careful, I mean, obviously you're not going to give a taxi driver a hundred dollar tip. You just have to. I know all the banknotes are the same size and the same colour, but you just have to be cautious when you're um, dealing them out. Yeah, but they're made of paper. They don't last. I wonder if there's any plans to change in America too. No, the... there wouldn't be. No, it's been the same system since uh, the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, of course they talk in miles and ounces and pounds. And well, I still like that. I'm afraid because I'm of that vintage where I can still never get used to someone being uh, what 182 <coughs> centimetres tall. And uh, no, I, I, I respect your point of view, Tony, but I like the way Americans stick with something forever, whereas we switch and change and experiment and. And uh, it's been a fortune along the way, you I, know. I have to say, though, boys, when when I was in the States 18 months ago, uh, Tony, when I showed people in America Australian money when I was there 18 months ago, they absolutely loved it. It was different colours. They, they could see hey, rainbow. Away. It can't really, it's like a rainbow here, see, man. Man, I could see straight away what oh, I wanted. Oh, I think. Come on, it's like Monopoly money, boys. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's all right for okay, you because boys. you can afford to hand out a hundred when you only mean to tip a dollar. You know, but us us fellas like Andrew and myself struggling away well, here working our okay. goods out from a quarry, we, we can't afford to lose that money like you can. Tony, we agree to disagree and I want you to have a wonderful holiday and I want you to come home safely and give us a call when you're back. Thanks for your call, Tony. Nice to hear from you. Shane is at Blacktown. Shane, good evening to you, sir. Yeah, thanks for taking me call, Andrew and Phil. G'day, mate. How you going, all right? Good. Look, I just wanted to actually perceive something I'm looking at. I've been, I listen to the media, I listen to the radio a lot, and uh, this year, exactly 100 years ago, in, if you get a picture back, 1916. Yes. What do you reckon a, hundred, a couple of hundred thousand Australian men were doing? Uh, fighting in uh, Turkey, or uh, fighting overseas, anyway. Uh, yeah, in the Western Front, for example, yes. That's right, Phil, and don't you forget it, mate. They were fighting on the Western Front, and they were fighting for their lives. And 50, over 50,000 Australian men were left there in 1918. And I just think with the centenary of the World War I, mm. I'm really concerned about how the media hasn't respected it, and they haven't shown enough information, especially to a lot of new Australians. I talk to a lot of new Australians out there, and I tell them about our, our country and our culture and our history, and they go, what? They didn't know anything about it because our media and our government have failed, I reckon, to put enough information on about these men who are fighting for our country, our country and our lives today. And, so, and yet, you know, let me tell you, I haunt different bookshops and news agents, and I've never seen such a plethora of books about World War I. Uh, I mean, if anyone's an avid reader, you can certainly uh, catch up on the, on the past there. Yeah, well, I just wanted uh, people to remember these people who actually fought for their lives today. They talk about so much other stuff and so much me, 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 but they don't talk about the no. people who actually were the foundations of this country and actually really, especially the French people. I talk to a lot of French people who come in this country, Phil, and I say, are you aware of how many dead Australians are in your country right now who fought for your lives? Mm. And they you're really blankly going, well, what are you talking about? Does that, does that include any of your ancestors? Yes, my grandfather was on the front lines now 100 years ago, mate. Yeah, he actually, and he survived where... You know, mm. One of the lucky ones. Uh, mm. well, was he gassed at all? Or? Yeah, well, it's funny, Phil. Have you ever seen that movie by a very famous uh, female director? Um, oh, you know, I can't remember her name now, but mm. she had a thing about a baker. And it's a true story about a baker who um, was an Australian man who didn't want to fight and he ended up being put, uh, put up on the front lines and he actually deserted. Oh, oh no. And it, was, and it was a true story. It's a, it's a brilliant movie. It's a shame I can't remember it, Phil, because you yeah. love it. Yes. And I cried right through it because I didn't realise, because it was a bit of a story about my grandfather too, because oh. he actually deserted after one of the main battles um, in World mm. War One, and he got gassed because he was in the 14th Infantry, and um, 14th Battalion Infantry, and in that 1,000 blokes, 960 got killed yes. through the four years, and 2,600 lost legs, arms, and were really seriously yeah. injured. But now, in now you, you say he deserted. Was he court-martialed because of that? Well, I shouldn't say that, but he actually was, let's just say, um, away without, without uh, leave. Uh, A-W-O-L, -A yes. Yeah, but he, what happened was he got gassed by mustard gas, and he was mm. found wandering by some French people. Mm. They took him in after the war. It was only a few months before the end of the war, and he, he got away with it. But in this movie, um, oh, you know the woman too, Brian Brown's wife. A Rachel Ward? Yeah, brilliant movie she directed. Oh. And she actually tells the true story of a, book, a baker. 
And when he actually deserted, this French lady took him in, mm. and then I didn't know it was so harsh. But they used to, the British used to shoot the Australians. Mm. Did they? they? Did, no, they did straight out. What do you mean at, at court martial? Um, court martial and then shot by the kangaroo court. And mm. then. Oh, um, I'm not sure about that. I've never no, heard that before. It was very clearly in this movie because it was based mm. on history and oh, the yes. French. Things in movies sometimes are not all that reliable, yeah. but it, it could well be. I'm, I'm not saying it didn't happen. And the French people used to be put in jail for about 10 years mm. for um, yes. harbouring any Australians who actually deserted. Yeah, well, well, maybe, but I hope you got your facts right here because, uh, to me, it's, it, I'm hearing this for the first time and it's a scandal. And I think if it was a reality, we would have known about it a long time ago. At the end of the movie, they give a very clear indication this is a true and, a, um, you know, uh, what do you call it, factual... Yeah, uh, OK, threat. well, try and let me know the name of the movie. I'll track it down, Jane. Sadly, we're out of time, but I'm sure sure on Anzac Day everybody will pay their due respects. The great... This is a real friend test. See if it applies to you. A simple friend when visiting acts like a guest. A real friend opens your fridge and helps himself. A simple friend has never seen you cry. A real friend has shoulders soggy from your tears. A simple friend doesn't know your parents' first names. A real friend has their phone numbers in an address book. A simple friend brings a bottle of wine to your party. A real friend comes early to help you cook and stays to help you clean. A simple friend hates it when you call after he's gone to bed. But a real friend asks you why you took so long to call. A simple friend seeks to talk with you about your problems. A real friend seeks to help you with your problems. A simple friend wonders about your romantic history. A real friend could blackmail you with it. A simple friend thinks the friendship is over when you have an argument. A real friend calls you after you had a fight. And a simple friend expects you to be always there for them. A real friend expects to be always there for you. Copyright restricts distribution of this piece by any means of duplication. Well, the jury's out, and uh, as a result, Simon's coming back tomorrow night. <laughs> I was found lacking. Uh, uh, you were found guilty. I've heard your material. <laughs> uh, but uh, it was a short stay, but for all of us, uh, a delightful one. And let me tell you, you're always so welcome on uh, Nightline or Remember When. Thank you, Phil. Yes, it's a pleasure to be here with you and Ken tonight. And uh, welcome back, Simon. Of course, tomorrow we're going to hear Cyboy. Yeah, and uh, let me just say uh, from my heart, you are one of 3AW's treasures. Oh, you're too sweet. Anyway. Do I have to stand and applaud you, though, when you leave the studio at midnight like Ken has to? No, no, perhaps take me out for a Big Mac and some French fries. <laughs> Ken is standing right now. I know. It's, it I is know. Yeah, it's and bowing and scraping. It's all about R-E-S-P-E-C-T. There was a song called Respect. And, yeah, and that's know, Aretha I, Franklin. I think I've earned it, don't you, after 58 years? <laughs> I suppose so, but to have to do it like this... And by the way, I'm just in case people are wondering, I'm on my knees at a much lower chair than yes, Phil is. Phil yes. sits up about a foot and a half higher than yes. Ken and I. And if you're not watching us, if we're streaming, I'm at the moment giving the paper wave to the newsreader. So that's the way we are. And uh, to the sick, the sad, the lonely, the grieving, you're always in our heart, always in our prayers. Thanks, Andy. A pleasure, Phil. And thank you, Ken.